I'm hunting for today's medical hero. He must be around here somewhere. Ah, there he is. Say hello to Dr. Scorpion. This formidable and dangerous creature is helping to make life-saving medicine. Even though they only eat insects, I am quite glad that he's in this glass box because his sting could be very unpleasant for me. Scorpions use their pincers to grab their food. Then they raise up their telson, that's the spiky bit at the end of their tail, to strike the target, stinging it dead with poisonous venom. And it's this precious venom that is helping to create new medicine for scientists like Dr. Keith Miller, or as I like to call him, the Scorpion King. So how do you get hold of scorpion venom? We have a team of people in Egypt who look around for scorpions, usually at night, and they get the venom out of their tails for us. That's one brave group of scientists. Now, once the venom sample is taken, the scorpions are returned to the wild. Now, you might be thinking, why find scorpions at night? Wow! Well, they glow in UV light, so it makes it very easy to find them. That is absolutely amazing. Scorpions have a hard outer layer, like armour, called an exoskeleton, and it's as though it's covered in glow paint. Keith, do all scorpions fluoresce like this? They do, yeah, and it's because they have a very thin layer in their exoskeleton called the hyaline layer, which reflects UV light and makes them glow in the dark. Now, what's so special about scorpion venom? So scorpions use their venom to hunt for food and to protect themselves from predators. If they get an infection in their stinger, then that can cause a problem for them. So scorpion venoms are made up of around about 150 different types of molecules. And there's one really special molecule in there called an antimicrobial peptide, or an AMP. That kills all sorts of different types of bacteria, fungi and viruses. And so the idea is that if it can kill bacteria for scorpions, it might be able to kill bacteria for us. Absolutely correct. Let's see some AMP molecules in action under the microscope. So the yellow colour here is a normal, intact human cell membrane. And when the little black bits start to appear, that's the AMP punching holes in that membrane. But you can see for a human cell, there's not too much damage. So what about a bacterial cell membrane? And as you can see, it's much faster and much more damage. Whoa, so there's no escape for those bacterial cells. And to show you what's happening, Keith has made a giant version of a bacterial cell with these ping pong balls to represent the cell membrane, which is the outer surface of the bacteria. What's going on here, Keith? Up close, this is what a cell looks like. Yeah. The surface is actually made up of lots of little molecules that are moving around and about like this. AMP molecules stick to the surface of a bacteria cell, but adding one doesn't do too much. But as well as sticking to the surface, uh -huh. the AMPs also stick to each other. And so you end up with a big ring of them that push all of these fatty molecules out of the way. Oh, wow. And that makes a big hole in the membrane. All of the stuff inside comes outside, and the cell doesn't like that and dies. So how can this be applied to medicine? What's the future for this? So we want to make these little AMPs into medicines. So we have to change them a little bit chemically and turn them into drugs, and then we can use them just like antibiotics are used today. But as well as that, we're also hoping that we might be able to use it against certain types of cancer cells. Well, I must say, Dr. Scorpion, you are absolutely incredible. I mean, not only are you wearing a permanent party suit, but also the molecules in your venom might save thousands of lives in the future. It's amazing. This is Chester Zoo, home to some awesome animals. Five months ago, something very exciting happened at the zoo. A baby elephant was born. This is actual CCTV footage of the birth. Say hello to Reva. She was up and walking just six minutes after being born. To see how she's doing now, I'm meeting elephant keeper Richard Fraser. She seems to be doing very well for five months compared to a, a human who is five months old. Why do they have to be moving so quickly after they're born? You know, large elephants, they're not prey for a lot of things. But baby elephants, obviously, are a lot smaller. They could still be taken by predators, so these guys need to be up and they need to be moving with the family and be in that secure social unit that they're protected. 
So what is it that makes the baby elephant able to walk so soon after being born? Mum's been pregnant for almost two years. 22 months is the typical uh, pregnancy of an elephant. Really? I mean, that's more than double a human pregnancy, which is nine months. Ouch. So then Mini-san said, is it a cake or is it a biscuit? And then Mini-Rongs ate the whole packet and Snow Person was laughing like anything. I mean, you couldn't make it up. Couldn't make what up? I was just filling in the Duchess on all the hot goss. It looks like you're talking to a snake. Yes, the Duchess is a royal python. Why are you holding her? If there's one thing a royal python like the Duchess likes, it's staying nice and warm. And I'm warmer than her. And we can show you using the thermal imaging camera. Now, a thermal imaging camera tells you the surface temperature of things. The white or yellow or orange stuff is hot, and the pink or blue or purple stuff is colder. You can see that my skin is much, much, much hotter than the Duchess. And in fact, if I put my hand on the Duchess, and leave it there for a few seconds. When I take it off, you can see I've left warm fingerprints on her skin. Human beings, like all mammals, are endotherms. In our cells, inside our bodies, we generate heat so that we maintain an internal body temperature of pretty exactly 37 degrees Celsius. But Reptiles, like the Duchess, are what's called ectotherms. The Duchess uses the environment to regulate her body temperature, and so the Duchess runs at a cooler temperature than us of about 22 degrees Celsius. Stand back! The special guest has arrived. Uh, what are you doing? Well, I heard you needed a beautiful bird with amazing reflexes, and here I am! I already have a real bird right here. Well, this is awkward. Sand, meet Blue. Oh. Say hello, Blue. Yes, he looks ridiculous. I couldn't agree more. I just think he's jealous of my beautiful green plumage. <laughs> now, Zand, Blue is an Australian blue-winged kookaburra. Now, I want to show you his head stabilisation reflexes. As my hand wobbles like a branch would in the wind, you can see Blue is able to keep his head amazingly still. This is called gaze stabilisation. It enables him to fix his eyes on his prey, no matter what. You know, Tinchi, ever since you walked into this lab, I was thinking, there's something familiar about this lizard. And then I got it. We've got the same great aunt Dolores. When I say great, I mean she's our great, 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 great. Great, 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 great Aunt Dolores. So that makes us cousins 50 million times removed. Um, Zant, what's, uh, what's going on? I'm just having a bit of a gossip with Cousin Tinchi here. Aren't you going to say hello? Hello, Tinchi. Hello, Chris. Mm, skin. <laughs> now, it's amazing to think that we really are all related to lizards. Tinchi's your cousin too, and it's all thanks to evolution. Evolution is the process by which all living things change over time to adapt to their environment. So although Tinchi and Zand may look quite different, they share lots of similarities, from the number of fingers on their hands to their salivary glands. Of course, they have differences too. One of them just lies around in the sun all day eating insects, and the other one is a lizard. It's the similarities between us and other animals that first allowed scientists to figure out that we evolved from common ancestors. One of the things that you share with Cousin Tinchi here are the bones in your ear, the ossicles. Humans have three ossicles and they're found in your middle ear, behind your eardrum. But because Tinchi has evolved differently, he only has one ossicle bone and the other two are now part of his jaw. And your ossicles are the smallest bones in your body. Take a look at these. We've had some life-size casts made of real human ossicles. And here they are. Look how tiny they are. They easily fit on a penny. This is the malleus. It's connected to the eardrum and also to the incus. And this is the stapes. The smallest bone in your body are just three millimetres long. But how do these ear bones actually help you to hear? 
Well, that's an excellent question, TT. Look, the point about ossicles is they work as a transduction mechanism, converting one form of energy into another. And Chris, it's... nobody's going to be able to take all this in. The best way to understand how you hear is by supersizing the ossicles by 5,000%. I must say, Zahn, this is very impressive. This, uh, this lovely pink fabric is almost exactly the same that's used in my uh, favourite ballet tights. What a coincidence. Mm. I'm glad you like it, Chris, because this is our supersized model of the ear. Now, let's get some sound waves moving through this ear. Chris, do the honours. Hello? Put some welly into it. Hello! Ah! Now, when sound waves leave my mouth, they travel through Zahn's outer ear, past the wax and the hairs, and they hit his eardrum. The middle ear begins at the eardrum, which vibrates when sound waves hit it. These vibrations are transferred through the ossicles, from the malleus to the incus to the stapes, and they're boosted to make them louder. The stapes presses on the inner ear, which contains the cochlea. That's a fluid-filled tube lined with tiny hairs and vibrations are sent down the tube and turned into electrical signals, which are sent to the brain through nerves, and that's how you hear. But it's a bit of a shame, Zon, that your model isn't accurate enough to really show how that movement is turned into a nerve signal. Well, yes, Chris, it would be a shame if I hadn't built a second model. Come and have a look at this. This is a model of your cochlea. It's only one section of it, now, let's remember what's happened. The sound has come in to your ear, it's hit the eardrum, it's moved the ossicles, and the stapes pushes on the cochlear membrane and sets up pressure waves in that fluid. So let's see what happens to the hairs. You ready? Yep. Here we go. That's awesome. The pressure waves caused by the ossicles are making the hairs move. And as those hairs move, they send electrical signals into the auditory nerve, and that goes into your brain, and that is how you hear.